So I would like to introduce you to a friend of mine. April, can you come up here? So our keynote today is, is a look at C++ at 40 years. So there's some looking back, but most of it's about looking forward to the future. And so as I think about the future of C++, I think about young people. Good morning, April. Good morning. So April is one of two high school students who are registered for this conference, and that is a first for us. And I'm very excited to have her here. You, uh, how do you use C++, April? Uh, I work on a lot of small hobby projects. Like currently I'm just making chess, but I love experimenting, uh, especially with games. That's uh -huh. my... Okay, that's yeah. exciting, all right. Uh, would you be interested in what the creator of C++ has to say about the future of C++? Definitely. Then why don't you <laughs> ask this group to welcome our keynote speaker? Okay. Everybody, please give a uh, warm suit of applause for the keynote speaker, inventor of C++, Bjarne Struestrup. So, um, welcome, and uh, it's quite a crowd. Um, that is not a picture of the global C++ community. It could have been, but it's just a slide I um, borrowed from the web um, <laughs> of something. Uh, I'm going to talk about C++ 20, not the, the far distant future, because I'm not actually that great as a sort of a blue sky visionary. I'll, I'll talk about things that we know a little bit about. As a matter of fact, we know almost everything about, which is C++ 20. And then I'll try and put it a little bit into a perspective, because it is about 40 years, plus minus a month, before I started at, uh, when I started at this. So it's, it's an obvious topic. I, I will, however, speak mostly about the, the current and the near future. I'm not going to go on about how it, it really was in the old days and you should have been there and all of that stuff. Um, there, there's a sort of one way of contrasting what has happened in those 40 years. Um, the two gadgets are more or less to scale. You can see the handset and the phone there. And um, I will point out that the gadgets to the left, the old one, is something that has to be attached to a physical system inside a wall for its power and connectivity. It's, it's, it's very different today. And one of the points I will make possibly repeatedly is that C++ actually had a significant part of this transition. If you look at a gadget like the one with C++ inside, it's not just that it's running C++ programs and that the key communication systems are C++. It's also that the manufacturing processes, the design of the processes, the data, data, data has C++ in it. Um, I have another talk which I won't give today, which is known as the invisible C++. The point is that if you do it right, nobody can see it. <laughs> but it is everywhere. <coughs> Another look here is, um, that's actually the computer I started on. It's a PDP 1170. The two guys, of course, is Ken and Dennis. Uh, this year is the 50th anniversary of Unix, which is another uh, great thing that has taken over the world and is found everywhere. Um, I'd like to point out that that computer there is less than a thousand of the speed of a Raspberry Pi. It cost um, maybe a thousand times more than a Raspberry Pi. Um, it, uh, the uh, Raspberry Pi weighs about 10,000 times less. But then, of course, that computer only had to serve 40 researchers. 
the world has changed, and we've been part of that change. Um, one problem I have, and I try to address, is that people actually describe C++ in ways that harms the community, and it harms the effectiveness of what we do. They, they, they have ideas that were outdated in 1990, and we hear them all the time. There can never be a, an article, anything I say on the web, without somebody coming, making noises that were inappropriate in 85 or thereabouts. But I'll point out that what is old is not necessarily bad. What is new is not necessarily good. We have to look at C++ as it is today. And by today, I mean C++ 20. I'll show a lot of code examples. I'm not going to label them with dates. Uh, you can have fun to think about when you could do this and whether you can actually do it on your current compiler and whether you can do it in your code base. I actually expect and somewhat hope that the answer is often you can't. And therefore, there is a path forward and we are getting ready to get you there. And it's not a talk about details. This is a keynote. I think every slide I have, there will be a one hour or more talk digging into that in depth. I'm not going to try. Find the talk and listen to it. And uh, my general approach, both for using C++ and for teaching it, is to focus on the essentials. Try and figure out what is the essentials, focus on that, and be advanced and clever only when you absolutely must. There's no prize for using the largest number of features or showing the most sophisticated example. That's something you do when you must. You try to keep simple, and we also, since C++ is an older language, have to distinguish between what is good, what is effective, what is useful, and what's legal. Uh, I'm not a language lawyer. Well, I guess I am. But I don't want to be. And um, I, I want to, to sort of ignore the, the subtle details as often as I can. And I'm going to, going to do here. That means that we need to have guidelines for how to use the language well and I'm working on the C++ core guidelines, which can be found in, in, in many places. This is not unique to C++, but I think it's very important. Uh, part of the inspiration for this talk and part of the, um, the background is an experiment I do every year. I, I get a class at uh, Columbia, and I get in students um, final year undergrads, first year graduates from all over the world, all over the US, all over the world. And so I give them uh, that book there. And the first exercise is tell me what you didn't know about the language. That is, you read the language chapters and you tell me what you didn't know. Then, second one, do the same for the chapters about the library. There's 200 pages, two weeks, uh, work and I get a lot of feedback and I'm always shocked. And so some of the things I'm going to tell you here, you know very well. But assume that the average student coming out of a good university will have missed about half. And uh, that's why I think this is a worthwhile exercise. Uh, C++ I think is principled and eclectic. It's a general purpose programming language, and the key uh, to the good use is definition, implementation, and use of lightweight abstractions. And a lightweight abstraction is something that directly represents an idea and does it in an affordable uh, and simple manner. And a language is not just product development. There's people who say, let's, let's just build the next release. You can't just build the next release for something that's supposed to last decades. You have to have a design philosophy and something to help you find what is essential. And I think we have had some success in that. And this has given a certain degree of stability over the de decades and a certain flexibility that you don't get if you just focus on the individual feature. 
I mean, people who think that they can't write a program without a virtual function because then it isn't good um, have been disproven a few times over the years. On the other hand, there are good uses of, of just about every feature in C++. And um, one of the things that um, have been a focus and also uh, was reflected in John's uh, opening remarks is that in the design of C++, the view is we have to do whatever it takes to get good production code. C++ is a language for building things, uh, for delivering systems, maintaining systems, uh, making systems affordable. It's, it's not particularly uh, aimed at a, a particular little group, uh, academics, students, uh, et cetera. It's, 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 it's fairly general purpose. And um, I'm sometimes reminded about a manager, high-level manager I once met in a company, which shall remain unnamed, um, who said, yeah, yeah, we don't really like C++. We only use it because it's the only thing that works. I thought a couple of seconds and said, oh, thank you. Um, so, but you can't just be expert friendly. I was actually the one that coined the phrase expert friendly as a caricature to people who wanted to be just expert friendly. You have to be simple enough for casual use. Most programmers, as long as our use of C++ grows, are going to be relative novices. And we have to focus on making the language simple enough and the techniques for using it simple enough that people can come on board. Uh, we should not try to enforce some kind of idea of theoretical purity. Uh, the theories change over the years for starters, and um, I, I've never seen a, a, a philosophy that covered absolutely everything that everybody needed in the C++ community. It's eclectic yet principled, so that's what we're going to do. So high-level aims, C++ is evolutionary. I knew from day one that I couldn't build a complete language for serving everything that I would like to serve. Therefore, you have to start at the beginning and then grow based on feedback, based on what you learn. Uh, so you have to evolve and you have to support gradual adoption because, well, people can't just throw all of their code away and uh, start again from scratch. Not large organizations, not people with millions of lines or billions of lines of code um, deployed. And furthermore, you have to be stable. A lot of the things I like most about C++ and systems building are things that you can't actually replace that easily. When you put a lot of gadgets out in the in the wild, you can't just go and replace them. When you uh, build a, a large infrastructure, it has to keep running. You can't take the electricity supply down for a month while you upgrade the software controls. This, this just, just doesn't work. So you, ha you have to uh, have stability, compatibility over years and decades. Um, people tend to forget that and think, let's just solve the urgent problems now but you know what happens when you succeed? Your stuff lasts. Only failures uh, will, you, you, can, you can just redo them again in a year or two. Successes last. Um, and there's been other things, try to make uh, simple things simple, which is the thing I'm going to talk about in this talk. And the zero overhead principle, that is don't have distributed fat, try and make sure that you can write the code so that uh, you can afford to run it. And you have to aim high. I, I don't actually think a 10% improvement is such a great thing in the big picture. It is a great thing for a particular system, for a particular year, but if you are thinking in terms of decades and language design and community, what you actually have to go for is significant to change the way we design and implement software. Basically, we have to change the way we think. 
And, and I'm not being patronizing and say this, you have to change the way you think. It's we, including me. Okay, so uh, the aim, the purpose of the exercise is to create uh, really good applications, really good uses. And as usual, I have some pictures uh, because I can't talk about all of these applications, though sometimes I would like to. So uh, the purpose of the exercise is to have great applications. And, you know, looking back, we actually succeeded to a large extent. This, this should be a happy event because, you know, we did something good over the years um, in the area of programming and design. Uh, code is written, deployed, and maintained in ways that are radically different from what it was a few decades ago. And C++ has been part of that. The C++ community has been part of that. Uh, the, the use of abstraction to more directly express ideas has, um, has spread. It's not just C++. It's, C++ has been one of the drivers of evolution of languages in the plural. Um, some people wanted to do things better than C++. Some things wanted to do things uh, different from C++. But it's been one of the drivers. Uh, hardware have improved. But hardware can only improve in combination with software. These days, software and hardware are not totally disjoint, and C++ has been part of that. And our compiler infrastructure, the, um, the way we analyze our code and uh, generate code, is radically different from what it was. And I'm happy to see that C++ actually, through LLVM and that kind of stuff, is actually one of the things that helps most programming languages, uh, modern programming languages these days. And then, of course, the applications, the scale is just enormously different from what it was. Sophistication is enormously different from that. Uh, C++ uh, has had a major impact in, in science and engineering. I mean, there's, there's, there's a reason I've gotten the highest awards for engineering and such. We, we've done well. Okay, so, yeah, there's been change. C++ has been been key to some of those dramatic changes. So let's get back to code. Um, if you look at the design and evolution of C++, you'll find uh, a list of uh, rules of thumb. I, I felt shy, I wouldn't call them principles. So rules of thumb. And this uh, list here, which is a subset of that list, is going to be my guide for this talk. And, um, there's a, there's a few. You have probably seen most of them. In other words, most of you have seen most of them. Uh, it's not just a list of features. It's an evolving language. The trouble and the challenge is to maintain coherency for a long, long time and aim for gradual and steady improvement. And there was and there is a plan, and you can read up on it. Um, there's some links there. So let's uh, look at it. Uh, C++ is a static type system with equal support for built-in and user-defined type. That's the ideal, and we come pretty close. Um, in other words, a type system is extensible. And having a static type system allows us to catch things at compile time because we can express things so that the compiler can understand it. Um, one of the things I like best about that is that if I can have my errors caught at compile time, I don't have to have a runtime error handler for that kind of error. And one of the hardest pieces of code to write is error handling. Um, strange things happen and you have to deal with them, and when things are strange, they're hard to deal with. Um, performance comes to a large extent by allowing the compilers and optimizes more information about what you're doing. Um, again, we, we're improving there, and the root of uh, a lot of the best improvements are in the static type system. And then the static type system allows us to be flexible, to be expressive. Uh, we have overloading. Uh, when we started back in the dark ages, square root of two gave a crash because early C couldn't 
figure out that int could be used as a double because it required a conversion. We have a type system that allows us to express things directly and make it work. We get generic programming, uh, metaprogramming, uh, and a lot of compile time evaluation if we can move computation to compile time, um, we, we can catch errors and, and run faster. Uh, so let's, uh, let's look at it. One of the things that C++ has, a uh, lot of languages are, are not uh, focused on that, is actually support uh, both value and reference semantics. So basically simple things like this, um, x becomes y plus z, x can be an int, complex, uh, a matrix, and basically the semantics is what you would expect. X becomes Y, then, well, X has the same value of Y, but they're still independent objects. On the other hand, we have a lot of types that must be a sort of pointer reference-like. Uh, it refers to something over there, and so um, we can assign through them, read from them, and if we make something that has a pointer or reference semantic, um, we have an assignment there, they'll refer to the same object. The combination of the two is, is one of the keys to, to C++'s success. And so all our most common types are, um, are value types, integers, characters, strings, the containers, and I think the semantics is ideal, but pointers and references are essential in the implementation of some of the most interesting of those types. So we have ordinary pointers, references, unique pointers, share pointers, all the rest. And basically, when we want to pass something along, we don't always want to do a copy, we just want to refer to it, and so they need to it. And, and both are needed to uh, give good use of the uh, hardware resources. So basically, once you get the ability to, um, to, to, to have built-in types and user-defined types work uniformly, you don't have to think all the time about what it is. Uh, the example here is, of course, the, the classical vector example, which, by the way, shows two levels of abstraction, the vector level and the implementation, which is pointers and, and stuff. Um, but I can have vectors of built-in types, vectors of um, user-defined types, and this all works recursively, so I can have a vector of vector of integers and that kind of stuff. If there had been different rules for built-in types and user-defined types, say user-defined types has to be created with new and live in the free store, and built-in types can be on the stack, this kind of stuff would not have worked well. Um, so. One of the things that, that has driven C++ is, is direct use of the machine. C++ usually, not necessarily, but usually don't work on a virtual machine, and it's, a, it's not a mathematical abstraction, it's, it's an abstraction of the machine. And, um, well, it means that the objects are lying in memory and we can point to them. Uh, memory is a sequence of object, or rather it is a set of sequences of objects, and we can combine things into new types just by sticking values next to each other, objects next to each other, you get arrays. If they're the same type, if they're different types, you can create um, objects, uh, structures, classes, and the pointers there turns into some kind of things with, with reference semantics. This is a very simple abstraction of hardware. This is the beauty of um, Dennis Ritchie's uh, view of the machine and the design of C. And I mention this because at least a third of my class, when I do this uh, class, don't get it. They haven't seen this before. This is shocking to them. And so please don't forget when you're introducing new people to C++, if they, if they haven't seen something like C before, they might need to see this slide. Uh, and of course, again, we abstract, we go one level higher. When you're dealing with, with hardware directly, all the sizes are fixed. Uh, there's no flexibility, there's no protection 
there's no uh, elegant error detection. So we move up a level. We always move up a level when we can. So we can have bit sets that'll give us the bit operations, but for an arbitrary number of elements. And we have uh, arrays which uh, have, have their size known. And we have spans, so there I have an array of um, some bytes, and I would like to manipulate it. This is something that happens all the time. Think buffers, think networking, uh, think string manipulation, uh, character manipulation and such. And so I want to span over that so that I can uh, uh, pass it around, I can uh, iterate over it with range for loops, and, and this is fine. Notice that I don't actually have to mention the type of the elements in the span or the size of the, uh, the number of elements in that span because, well, the compiler knew it already and why should I tell the compiler something that the compiler knows? I can, if I want to, give a size. I can, if I want to, give a type. Sometimes we need this. But whenever I say something, I might get it wrong. The compiler is more likely with almost perfect knowledge and very systematic rules are more likely to get it right on average than I am. So I don't actually trust this kind of stuff where I am being explicit as much as when uh, the compiler knows it. Again, we are moving up a level from the pointers to zero terminated arrays of integer uh, ca characters or something like that. And this is something I, I tend to refer to as the onion principle. Uh, the average C++ program is a, is a set of layers of abstraction. And you can always peel off one layer. You get more details to express, you get more, um, uh, you, you, you get more controls, you get more opportunities to make mistakes, you have to say more to work, in other words, you cry more. And basically, this is one of the ways we manage complexity. We have many, many layers, and once I found the picture, I noticed something interesting. This is not just layers. There are sort of irregularities that are being absorbed and encapsulated. This is good stuff, so I think it's a, it's a good uh, way of thinking about how to structure software. So let's get back a bit. Uh, one of the first things that came into C++ was, uh, was uh, basically constructors and destructors. And so basically, we can look at uh, the constructor-destructor pairs. Uh, they came in in the second week of C++ design. So uh, they're, they're the rock bottom of C++ here. Everything rests on it. Um, so we have a gadget. We create a gadget. It acquires some resources that it needs to function memories, file handles, locks, I don't know. And you know, most of the time, I don't have to know and I don't have to care. Because once we're finished, it cleans up its own mess. This is important. We can copy, move them, rest, uh, give it the, a good user interface. And then the next level of abstractions down here that are, is of course represented uh, in terms of something else. This is fine, and uh, if we have a local variable like this that's a gadget. Uh, if I throw an exception, if I return from the middle, if I fall down the bottom, I know that the, whatever messes that might be will be cleaned up. So basically, if you have every resource owned by an owner like gadget, then the cleanup, the destruction happens automatically. You don't have to worry about it. It also tends to be uh, optimally fast, it, when you get out of the scope, it uh, goes away. It means you have minimal resource retention. Resource retention is a real pain in the neck if you have limited resources. And basically, don't, don't, don't try, oops, oops. Don't try and uh, handle uh, ownership with raw pointers. Uh, we have maybe 50 years of experience to say we are not very good at it. We actually need to do something else. And the close to unique facility in C++ is that it is directly supported. 
Um, there's one thing that um, has been a source of a lot of user pointers for ownership, which is people want to make a big thing, like a factory function. And so they create an object, they fill it up with good stuff and have to pass it back, and the traditional way is to pass it back with a pointer. If you do that, you now have to deal with memory management explicitly. You have to re remember to delete that pointer, or you have to use a shared pointer, which means that you have to maintain use counts and the synchronization on use counts, or you have to use unique pointers, which a lot of people haven't learned yet. There's a much better way. It's old as the mountains, but we can do it better now. Um, so here, uh, we simply return the gadget. And most of the time, the compiler is smart enough to figure out that I have a local variable there, which I want to become a local variable in the external scope very soon. So let's allocate it so that we don't have to move it at all. We certainly don't want to copy it. But if the compiler can't figure this out, we fall back to uh, move semantics, uh, where we say, okay, there's the gadget. Big things tend to be a handle to the real stuff. Handles are really cheap uh, to copy. Uh, so what we do is we steal the representation from G, put it into, GC, in, into GG, and remove the link from G. Problem solved, we can move uh, something with a million elements, uh, two file handles, and a, and a lock out at the cost of essentially nothing. So that's important. And now we have a complete control of the of the object cycle, the life cycle for objects, creation, copy, move, and destruction. That's important. And um, this is sort of pervasive in the standard library. I wish it was pervasive in all libraries, but we're getting there. Um, and it's not just memory. So when people talk about garbage collection, they can handle everything up here, provided it's only memory. But there's lots and lots of things that aren't memory. Uh, threads, mutexes, uh, scope locks, uh, file handles, ta -da -da -da. So I'm not a great fan of garbage collection. Uh, I would like to put it out of business if I can. And of course, again, all of this works recursively. So I can have a vector of a forward list of a pair of a string and a J thread. Ta da. It, it seems has to work in composition, in collaboration. This is how we get reasonably simple and maintainable code. So, um, back to, to this list of uh, rules. Um, support composition of software from separately uh, developed parts. Oh yeah, uh, C++ applications are not all sort of grand and sexy. That's a coffee machine there. Uh, it's, it's of course programmed in C++. I talked to the people who are doing the development of it. And I like this one because my favorite definition of a programmer is a machine for turning caffeine into code. And, and yes, I have a machine not quite as fancy as that in my office. Um, otherwise, I'd never get any code done. Anyway, back to uh, composition. Um, we compose uh, software out of modules. Remember, I'm assuming C++ 20 here. And um, so if I want to write a map printer, which is sort of the smallest reasonable program that fits on the slide, um, I'll import STD, which unfortunately isn't standard, but it's easy enough to define. You just grab all of the uh, standard library. Um, and then I import my own containers, and then I want to export the, um, the, the, the map printer there. It's, it's a temp template, it require, uh, takes a forward range and prints uh, anything that has uh, printable uh, uh, key and value types. And then I do a, a loop over the um, elements there using structured binding and write out the key value pair. And that's nice, it's simple. And as a matter of fact, it's, you don't have to remember a lot of things, just give me the standard library. That, that's the way to do it. Um, so basically, modules support clean code. It minimizes dependencies about things you bring in, um, and it, it avoids circular dependencies. Some of you are probably thinking, well, 
that's not the way my code looks. I have uh, oodles of includes and uh, we have to be careful about them. Yeah, that's the point. You have far too many includes and you have to be far too careful. We're doing better these days. So modularity, if I import A and B, it means the same as importing B and A. Fine, that's the way things should be, right? Why should I know about this? And why should A be able to inf uh, infect B with information? If I wanted dependencies, I should state them. And uh, only the used part of an imported uh, module is turned into generated code. So when I grabbed all of STD there, I didn't load up my memory with et cetera junk that I didn't use. I just said, I, I want it to be accessible. And there's only one copy of a module, so you don't have to copy this uh, uh, to, to, to analyze it. Um, a hundred times because you uh, included something a hundred times. So basically, all the major features of C++ exist to support composition. Modules, classes, concepts, templates, functions, aliases. Uh, if, if you can't compose, you have to replicate. And the, you get the code many times. If you get the code many times, if you fix the bug in one place, you can't fix it in the other places. That is no good. You want to actually compose things out of unique parts. Uh, incidentally, that is a Lego Turing machine. Given that, you can do anything, but it is the lowest level of abstraction, so you may not want to do that in production code. Um, so let's see. Generic programming is something that I've worked on on and off. Um, the first paper on civil classes, the ancestor of C++, which was written in 81, um, uh, says we need generic programming. And I thought I could do it with macros. Boy, was I wrong. Uh, generic programming, we want to write code that works for types that meet abstract uh, requirements. So we start out wanting to be able to sort anything that's sortable or uh, do arithmetic on anything that actually is our numbers and things like that. Uh, so we have uh, concepts like forward iterator is in, if integral is regular and can be sorted, things like that. Uh, you'll notice the integral is in KNR1. So this is pretty fundamental and not all that new. And a concept is a simple compile time predicate on a set of uh, types and values. So if I want, say, a sortable range, which is the things that I want the sort to work on, I can say it should be an access range, it should be, its iterator should be permutable, and it should have an indirect strict order. Uh, you can look the meaning of those concepts up in the uh, C++ 20 uh, committee draft that is now uh, being voted on, and this is good, good standard stuff. And now I can say I want to sort a sortable range uh, say that's a vector of uh, strings, that'll work fine because a string has those properties, a uh, vector of strings has those properties. I can try it with a list of integers. However, lists do not have the random access range, so it does not work. So the static type checking works out nicely. The ability to um, express things concisely by using what the compiler already knows works nicely. I have been wanting to write sort of vec in standard C++ for ages. I've had to fake it um, so far. We, we, we do better. But anyway, what if I really wanted to sort the list? Well, I can define a forward sortable range, which basically is just a forward range, and it has iterators that can be used for sorting against standard. And now I define my own forward uh, sortable range. There's a nice algorithm for that in um, in elements of programming, or you can just copy the uh, range into a vector sorted and copy it back again. Uh, but you can do it. And now they will both work. And uh, if I sort a list, well, I can't sort it with a, with a sortable range, which is random access, so we'll pick that one. And for the vector, it has all the properties required for this, so it'll work. It just works out of the box. And so my idea uh, is that gen generic programming is just programming. It's programming like we've known it for a long time. 
Um, take your time machine, go back to last year, listen to my keynote then, it was all about that. Uh, basically, a concept specifies an interface, a type specifies an interface plus a layout. And basically, there's not that much difference between, say, sort of vector and square root of x. Ba both of them works for a set of types that has a set of required properties, and it does it well. And I don't actually really want to know whether that was an overloaded set of functions and that's a generic function. It'll just work from a user point of view. And of course, the default sort uses less than, and we have all the alternatives for specifying uh, what criteria we want. I can sort in, in uh, the opposite order. I can sort with lower case uh, if, it's, uh, if it's lists and such. So let's uh, breeze through this again. Um, Object-oriented programming has had a, a bad press uh, over uh, the last few years. Um, I guess we can blame various languages, including C++, but certainly there are languages that think that you have to be um, use inheritance all the time. Uh, C++ can do inheritance, and there's a lot of applications where it's the right thing. Here is the uh, old uh, draw all shapes examples uh, from about uh, 69, 67, thereabouts, when I first learned it from uh, Christian Newgall, who designed Simula and came up with this stuff. We have an abstract base class, we have some overriding functions, we build a hierarchy, and uh, then we can uh, draw all the shapes. Here, I've taken the forward range. I want all the things to be derived from shape. Then I can do a range for loop over and print them all out. The test example here uh, shows that I make a bunch of shared pointers. You need pointers to do um, classical object-oriented programming because you program against interfaces. You don't know what are in those interfaces. You don't know if that shape is a circle or a smiley face or a triangle. So you inherently work with uh, less information through pointers. And uh, I use smart, smart pointers, of course, because in this case I need pointers and I use the smart pointers to avoid leaks. I really hate leaks. Now, um, I'm wondering, is this object-oriented programming? I don't need uh, runtime uh, resolution in many cases, and so I can use a variant. Give me a variant of a circular triangle and smiley. This is a closed set of alternatives. This solution is an open set of alternatives, but because this is a closed set of alternatives, you can do certain optimizations that you couldn't do with an open set. So I can do things like this, uh, draw all, uh, draw all the th uh, V in that vector here, um, which was a vector of vi variant, and I visit them, and if it's a circle, do it the circle way, triangle, draw back, the usual stuff. This, by the way, works much better if the, variance, if the elements of the variance are roughly the same size or you have to start implementing with interactions. So for a closed set this, of similar objects, this makes a lot of sense. For an open set of dramatically different objects, uh, this one makes more sense. Um, there's a slight problem here. I don't know if you noticed the overloaded function here. That's the one that allows me to write um, the, the, the variance visitor uh, very, quite simply with the lambdas I used. So, uh, you know, C++20 isn't perfect. It is not the end, uh, end of all development in C++. But, you know, C++ is extensible. If it's not in the standard, you can just build your own. Uh, here's your build your own. I hope this one will be uh, in, the, um, in the next standard, C++23. Um, this uh, is, is not totally obvious to anybody with a background in old C++ or C, but you can look and look it up. Um, there's always another level of expertise. There's always another... Um, sort of uh, layer of the onion you can peel off. Some of them are, are quite simple, uh, not necessarily easy to understand, but you know, 
If you need more than it's available at the simplest level, at the most abstract level, at the most convenient level, you can always peel off uh, a layer of your onion. Um, so we need to use machines and operating systems uh, resources uh, simply uh, and directly. And concurrency is one of the major things. I mean, just about anything we do these days involves some form of concurrency. And to make life difficult, there are many, many forms of concurrency. So um, here I'm thinking about locking, thinking about the basic level of concurrency with threads and uh, lo uh, locks. So I have a mutex that protects some data. I have another mutex that protects some other data. I have to grab both of them to do an operation. I have to grab both uh, mutexes to, um, uh, to, 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 to get any work done. And I better not deadlock. I mean, I don't want this piece of code to take M1 before M2 and this one to take M2 before M1. It's simply solved in the standard library. Uh, you ask the scope lock to grab both. It will proceed here once it's got both. And this is our AII, so it releases at the end of the scope. It's, it's, it's all quite simple and removes one of the most common forms of, um, of deadlocks. Um, there's people who have been working over the last sort of 20 years. They observed that mutex is uh, an operating system resource and therefore relatively expensive. So we, we need to protect the use of mutexes with something cheaper, so we get to double locked initialization using an atomic uh, for that. And so we go through the, um, the operations of, uh, of, of double locked initialization, which looks very, very simple, and we have eliminated the data races that could easily happen with, with bad code of this and it's at a quite reasonable uh, level of uh, abstraction. You use a cheap synchronization mechanism to, produce, to protect an expensive mechanism, which protects the precious initialization. Um, if this is uh, too high level for you, if you really need to tune it for a particular piece of code, maybe a code on a machine where the compilers weren't able to generate this code, from the higher level code, you can do it. There's always another uh, layer uh, of the onion. But don't do this unless you have to. So one thing that I find with C++ is that it's tunable. And there's a scenario I find in person or on the web many times every year. A proponent for some, usually new language, X says, look, See, uh, X is uh, faster than, or as fast as, or almost as fast as C++. Uh, it is interesting that being not that much slower than C++ is often claimed to be a great achievement. Okay, the answer is, well, the proponent of C++ says, your, your, your C++ proponent is very poor C++. It's, it's not colloquial. No experienced C++ programmer would write it like that. Try this, it is as fast as or faster than what you just showed. And the proponent of X usually says, that's cheating. You have violated one of my uh, fundamental assumptions about how you should write code. The C++ programmer scratches his head and says, that's not one of my assumptions. Anyway, before this discussion got much further, uh, another proponent of C++ comes in and says, you know, um, the, the, the first C++ programmer's version is it's not nearly as uh, fast as it should be. Here's a much faster version. I've tuned it carefully. And by now the proponent of language X says, but my version is much easier, simpler, cleaner. And some C++ proponent says, yeah, but I need the performance. I need the small size or whatever it is we need it. Okay, but if we grant the elegant, easier, safer, which are properties I really love and I want them in C++ if I can get them. So we wait soon after some other proponent says, yeah, here's a library that does that. Um, sometimes it's a bit clunky, but 
it, it'll, it'll do it, and then you wait a bit, and if it really was as important as was claimed here, uh, C++ will develop a feature that uh, will actually do that, matching the original claims of performance and, and elegance. C++ is tunable, and it is evolvable, deliberately evolvable from day one. And so, since it's tunable, you can make sim simple things simple, as long as you don't make complicated tasks impossible or unreasonably hard to do, and you go to the onion principle. But please provide that first level and make it possible to go to the next level. Don't, don't close the door. Uh, to, to, so uh, this, this layer architecture is good. And the, as you saw with the onion, it's not quite layers, it's encapsulated uh, areas of code. And you don't drop to the lower level of abstraction uh, unless you really, really need to. After all, interfaces, one of the uses of interfaces is to hide ugly stuff. And so it doesn't have to be pretty all the way down. And don't make any claims of the need to go lower level and need to optimize unless you measure. And, and, and be careful. I've seen examples recently where people optimized based on their local machine, their laptop or something like that, and they got really nice results. They proved that things really work much faster with their fine-tuned code. And then you move it onto the server and the production stuff, and you have actually pessimized the optimization. I mean, many more threads, many more locking can really kill you if you have optimized for the wrong thing. By the way, the first time I noticed this phenomenon, it's a long, long time ago, it was in the 80s, John Bentley came and showed a highly optimized program for a PDP 1170 that when ported to a Cray, which was 100 times faster, ran 16 times slower. So be careful. Yes, never talk about performance without measure, but, but really be careful. Furthermore, if you have something that runs nicely on, on one of the big uh, national lab machines, it may actually not work very well on your machine, and so you, you, you may have to change the optimization and such uh, when you move it onto to smaller machines. And so this is one reason you want the higher level interfaces because then you can go to the lower level separately from different kind of architectures. Again, direct use of system resources. Here's a very simple use. I have n threads that does my n tasks. Fine, we use RAII. Um, at the end of the block, they all um, wait for each other, and when everybody is finished, we proceed. Can't be much simpler than that. However, what if I'm doing something like a parallel search, and I only want to know one? So when one of these uh, tasks, threads come up and says, I got it, I would really like to tell the other, um, the, the other threads, the other tasks to go away. That's the way you do that with uh, J threads. You, you have a t stop token, and most of the code that we write has some kind of outer loop that says do something, then do more, then do more. And so at a top of the uh, loop, you just check, are people still interested in my result? And if the answer is no, I'll go away. That's the oldest solution to this problem. It is now quite simple, supported by the standard. Again, first level, second level of the onion. Okay, I really don't actually want to write threads and tasks and lock synchronization, that kind of stuff. What I want is parallel algorithms. If I can get them, I want to sort things. Compilers can't be trusted uh, to actually figure out whether you want to parallelize and vectorize because well, that depends on the data and by and large the compilers don't know about the data. So I can give it hints on sequence, parallel, parallel on sequence, this is fine. And I can write, and this is a scaling function here. Um, I want it vectorized and I just want to scale all the elements. This, this is sort of the level of code I would like to write. There's only one snag. 
uh, we ran out of time for C++ 20. So I have to drop down one level again. Uh, here is what we have provided. There's an execution policy, like uh, par onsec and onsec, and it uses the old style itera uh, iterators. I really want to use my range. Well, it's not, uh, it's not brain surgery. You just write it. And one thing that has been increasing from, from day one of C++, but especially since uh, uh, Gabby does raise and I uh, proposed uh, constant expression evaluation, constant expert functions in 11, is compile time programming. Uh, the basic idea is if you can move computation from runtime to compile time, you can get more elegant code, you can get more performant code, you get less calculation off on the doodle pad that gives you constants that uh, might go wrong. Uh, if you can do it once by the compiler, instead of a billion times, you probably have a performance advantage. Uh, and then you don't need the runtime error handling again. And I like constants. They're getting more and more important with concurrency because you can't have a race condition on a constant. And it's everywhere. Overloading and virtual functions each move a very common operation from writing it explicitly or resolving at um, runtime to compile time. Templates does a lot of that. Variadic templates is a good example of that that has cr created much more flexibility in the way we write our interfaces and basically context work in. So here's the integer square root that uh, I got a mail about maybe 20 years ago, somebody in the embedded systems industry wanted an instance of square root um, a, at, at compile time, and it took us a few years to figure out how to do it, but that's the simplest square root algorithm I know. I'm saying it's const expert, so I can uh, take the square root of nine. I could have done that myself, uh, but then I would have the magic constant three in the program, and, and, and how would I know that it was meant to be the square root of nine? Because when I'm reading your code, if I see three, I do not know why it's there unless it says so. So you'd have to have a comment that is far longer, a lot more long-winded than, um, than the code. Uh, instead of square root of one, two, three, four, I may not have actually have recognized at all. And it's not just compile time computation. The C++ type system is extensible. It is meant to provide the same support for user-defined code and built-in user-defined types and built-in types. So we can do that. Here's an example from the uh, from Chrono from the date library. I want to write out the weekday of some day in the past, and. If I want to check it's right, I can actually have the compiler check it for me, the static assert. That means that things like June, with the weekday of June 21, uh, 2016, is actually comprehensible to the compiler. It's comprehended and it can figure out the answer, and it does. It also means that the code here, well, there will be no code generated, but the code here will also be uh, very close to optimal. And we can use things like uh, complex numbers, three plus uh, 2.7i, i for imaginary, composing times, which is quite common, and composing real strings as opposed to uh, C-style strings. And it's, it's, again, it's quite simple. Here's the code for the suffix i used for imaginary. It simply returns a complex number with an imaginary part and zero as the real time so on and so on. It's fairly simple and elegant. Again, back to direct use of the, um, the, the hardware. Um, one of the things that's really, really fundamental in the programs, so fundamental that we don't usually think about it, is stack frames. When we call a function, it creates a stack frame. That uses the machine, and it uses stacks. Machines are optimized for stacks. However, if you want a code team, you want to have a computation that gives a result, waits a bit, and when you ask it the next time, you, it, it, it continues its computation and give that um, uh, the next result. Then we have to be able to do invocation frames. 
that doesn't follow a, a stack, uh, doesn't necessarily follow a stack allocation strategy. So would like to do that. And I particularly would like to do that because it was my bread and butter for 10 years with C, the early years with C++. We wouldn't be here if C++ hadn't been really good at that. But unfortunately, um, the Sun developed the Spark architecture where my trickery with stack frames and uh, registers didn't work anymore and they didn't ship it, so we lost it. So one of the things cold teams get directly um, is generators and pipelines. When you get a little bit more advanced, you can get uh, fairly sophisticated simulations, which was what I was doing. But here's an error just in a sieve. Um, I would like an infinite sequence starting with two. I want to filter out the, um, the, the, the things that aren't primes. And I would like to get me the first 10,000 of those. That's fairly simple. Oh, yeah, I want to print them. Um, we need a little bit of boilerplate. Here is uh, the coroutine. It, it, it returns a generator that each time you ask it gives it the next integer. Uh, so basically, the first time you call it, it gives you start, which was two, the second time three, and so on. And then um, here's the way we, we, we take from a sequence. If we have a sequence here, potentially infinite, uh, we can uh, simply uh, give me the next element uh, until we have gotten the n elements we wanted, the count elements we wanted, um, 10,000 in that case. The Eratosthenes' sieve is a little bit more complicated. Give me the first one, make a filter, and then, uh, then, then do that recursively. And then the filter simply uh, looks for the next, uh, next prime. Um, okay, uh, it, it actually works. There's the uh, output there. I didn't hand calculate this. That was all the code you needed. Um, yeah, C++ in space. Um, I don't know if you noticed. I wasn't actually using integers. I was writing generic code. Fairly primitive generic code. I had a using int being integer. But what if I wanted more, pri uh, more primes? I could use the long long simply by aliasing long long instead of int. And I could use my uh, infinite um, precision uh, integer uh, if I really wanted big uh, primes. This is a brute force technique. It's not the way you would probably uh, do uh, Eratosthenes' sieve, but it illustrates the techniques and it illustrates that you have the cold chains that are fundamentally a, a, a way of organizing computation and using hardware with the generic code um, and aliasing as a composition mechanism. And more, most of the use of, of cold chains today are actually uh, simple asynchronous, uh, speeding up sim simple asynchronous operations. Here's a buffer. I read from a, a socket and I write for a socket. And it this one waits till there's something read. This one waits uh, till there's something to write. And so basically the idea again and again is that these things have to work in combination. And all of these principles on my list, the rules of thumbs on my list works in combination. And one of the things we do is to build library from it. A user shouldn't have to care whether a feature is implemented, a type is implemented as a built-in or as a, um, as, as, as a library facility. And at, at Bell Labs, we used to say that library design is language design and language design is library design. It's fundamentally the same thing. You're trying to allow the users to express their ideas directly and affordably. And so we, we need great libraries. Um, the standard library should be designed um, with the same principles as the uh, language facilities because, well, it is fundamentally the same thing. I don't want to know whether a complex number is a built-in or a user-defined type. Um, we have lots of libraries. A lot of them are in the standard, and we should get more in the standard in the future. And there are lots and lots of other languages 
I mean, there, there's at least an order of magnitude, probably two orders of magnitude between the, the nice stuff we get in the standard library and the nice stuff we get by downloading. Um, so the rules of talk. Um, what am I going to do here? Oh, one of my favorite new libraries here is Chrono. And um, it gives us time points, durations, days, months, years, and time zones. Now, one of the things is that once you get to, day, to calendar kind of stuff and time zones, things get very messy. This is not math anymore. It's not computer science anymore. It's, it's a combination of physics, physics and local uh, conventions. Especially the local conventions are very tricky, like the time zones or the, um, the, the leap seconds and, and things like that. And the standard library kernel takes care of that. So here is something I found in my mail one day from uh, Howard Hinnant, who designed Chrono. And so I looked at it a bit. Uh, so he's using Chrono, and he says, for all days starting from that date until the year becomes 2020, uh, move forward two weeks. So he's looping over a two-week period of a year, and then he gives me the he, he, he grabs the time in London, plus 18 hours. Um, oh yeah, it's six o'clock in, in London. And then he writes it out. He uh, then gets the version of that time for, uh, for, for the uh, standard Eastern time in, in the US. And just to show off, I think he gives the uh, Greenwich Mean Time the UTC. Now, that is the schedule for the uh, C++ Standards Committee's direction group. So I uh, printed it out, and this is our meeting times. Uh, you, can, you can use this for, for very useful and interesting things. I wouldn't have guessed that, and I think most of you wouldn't have guessed this was an obvious and easy implication. Notice the for loop and the time zones and things like that. Uh, that, that one digs tunnels. Um, so, except for implementation details and sides, I did not mention all of these things. Sizes, raw pointers, allocations, deallocations, loop control, cost, macros, um, resource um, overflows, uh, all of this kind of good stuff that people talk about. You can talk about C++ without going there. Don't go to that level unless you have to. And we can do most of the things that we are using as an implementation at that level. Uh, we have to separate what we want to do and what we can do. Uh, and I'm encouraging you to write uh, modern C++. And this is hard because a lot of us have sort of internalized this kind of stuff over the years, and anything that's new uh, is often assumed to be uh, useless, complicated, and too expensive. It isn't, on average. So let's try and do it, and we have to distinguish what works, what's maintainable, what runs, and what's affordable. And basically, you can, usually at the higher level, write type and resource safe C++, no leaks, no memory corruption, no garbage collector, no limitation of expressibility, no performance degradation. You don't have to leave standard C++, and the tools are coming along. Uh, there's some in Visual Studio, there's some in Clang Tidy. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, this kind of guarantees to be actually guaranteed by a program. You can, by the way, never get there if you are writing 88 vintage C++. You have to lift the level of abstraction to the point where the analyzers can understand what you're doing. And I find that one of the good measures of good code and good performance is that I can understand it. If I can't understand it, there's a good chance that the optimizer can't understand it, and there's a good chance that there's bugs in it. So the best way of optimizing stuff is to use good libraries, use the standard facilities, then throw away the clever stuff and see if it still runs fast enough. And often it does, and sometimes it speeds up. 
And so, one of the interesting things about this talk, and the thing that was the inspiration of this talk, is that these rules of problems are old. They are picked from the design and evolution of C++, which was from 94, when I was forced to sort of collect the rules I've been using for C++. And I think this is one of the things that has given stability over the years. The, the language features change, the feature set change, the implementations change, the optimizers change, but some of the fundamental concerns for performance, uh, reliability, use of uh, resources do not change. And that, that's why this still works. So I was talking about C++20, at least I claimed I was. So what is this to do with C++20? What is C++20? It's basically the best approximation of C++'s ideals so far. I expect C++23 to be a better approximation. I expect C++26 to be a better approximation of that. We are not at the end of history. And we, we, we get a lot of useful features in uh, C++20, but a language is not just a set of features, and the language is not a layer cake. I, I encourage you when you talk to people, when you try to explain what C++ is, don't start with C and then saying, and then in C++ 98 we got, and then in C++ 11 we got, and so on. You will just tire people out before you get to the end. Start with the simple and elegant, and then peel off a layer of the onion when you have to. Um, it's, so C++ is a general purpose programming language for the definition in implementation and use of lightweight abstractions. That's still true. It's not just a grab bag of features. There's a set of ideals. There's a set of design principles. And yes, a community, as um, John pointed out, it's an evolutionary process. And it is a process in, in WD21. So let's just remember the standards committee. They've been hard at work for 30 years. And uh, starting out, that was a group there. And this was when we voted out modules. Uh, Richard Smith and Gabby Dos Reyes were the main uh, designers in that with help from lots of others. And you can see the committee was very, very happy when we got modules. So this is old story about a journalist coming up to an accomplished person and says, okay, you have cured cancer and ensured world peace. So what are you going to do next? People are never happy, right? You want more. So C++ is, 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 is the best approximation. It's not perfect, of course, but it's actually great. C++23, I think, should complete C++20. There are things you cannot know till you ship. There are things you cannot put into the latest release because there's a feature freeze. We need a couple of years to actually learn what this is at scale. So there will be a lot of completing things, like getting ranges used more systematically, da 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 da. And then we would like to see standard modules. I would like my import STD instead of having to do it myself. Um, library support for code chains is incomplete. And executors, which is the model of concurrency, and finally getting networking in place is a good idea. And if we have time, static reflection, more compile time uh, evaluation, but here with generation at compile time, and functional style pattern matching. There's been experiments with that. There are people working on all of these things. This is an approximation of what C23 might be, as suggested by uh, Wille Wuttelainen, and actually supported by the directions group. And uh, well, it's hard to make predictions, but this is what. Uh, I think we, we might be seeing in the future. And so basically the executive summary is that C++20 is great. Uh, the votes have started. Uh, national body uh, comments are being sent in. Uh, we have a committee draft voted out for that. Um, there will be resolutions of problems uh, found in uh, the next two meetings and hopefully in Prague in February, uh, we will uh, vote in C20. Um, we, 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 we know 
the outline of it. We don't know the last little details, but this is not a detailed talk. It's not going to be perfect. We're never going to reach there as long as we have, uh, haven't stopped evolving. And you can go for the in-depth talk for all the features here, and all the major parts will ship in um, C++ 20, meaning next year. And the reason I predict that is all the major parts of C++ 20 is shipping somewhere today. It's just that we don't have all the implementation shipping all of the major features today. That is next year, presumably before the ISO in Geneva managed to approve the standard. We were supposedly getting this stuff early. Thank you. How is Coalate going to interact with um, the executor? So will it block a thread or will it? Uh... Um, since executors are still not finished, I do not know how cool teams interact with them, but I believe that um, you, you, you get a choice. And in particular, it's possible to stack up a stack of cool teams, have them optimized at once uh, to do lazy evaluation. That was true a few months ago. Uh, good morning. Thank you for taking my question, Keith Miklas. It's my name, I work in the financial community. One of the problems I face is legacy code. Often on projects, we're working with code that's at least 10, if not 20 years old. And as I see you present these great new ideas and concepts, can you give me any advice as to how to migrate legacy systems? Often there's a, a lot of resistance to changing these systems because they work and they've been hardened. Thank you. Um, I have a slight problem with the, the microphone, the echo up here. So if I get your question slightly wrong, please either correct me or forgive me. Um, legacy code is a major problem. Um, we have, well, 40 years worth of legacy code, and in many industries that means that there are code that are 20 years old that um, are essential for, the, uh, for an organization. Uh, they don't know how it was written, the documentation isn't there, the people who wrote it weren't there and uh, the uh, unit testing had barely been invented and the regression testing is incomplete. And uh, that is a major, major problem. Um, I think my approach is, is twofold. One is for new code, try to use the modern features and write modern code. Secondly, uh, try to get rid of the old code either by encapsulating it or by actually uh, re rewriting some of the older systems bottom up. Um, we are not going to get anything near perfection until we get more tool support for analyzing both old and modern code to detect problems. So you need things like leak finders, and I prefer, if I can, to get static leak finders. That is, if you can write your code so that you don't have any leaks, that, that is the best way to do it. We are not there yet. There are research and deployed solutions for rule checkers, leak checkers, things like that. But legacy problems is, legacy code problems is common to all languages that has been successful. Legacy code often is just old code and if it still works, it's really hard to get the bean counters to, uh, uh, to understand that we are actually building up technical debt and need to clean up the messes, but we have to eventually. Uh, other languages doesn't have as much legacy code as C++ because they don't have as much code, but they'll get there if they succeed. Uh, hello, uh, Alex from Absolera Biologics. 
I have a question. Uh, what was the one single feature in that appeared in uh, C++11 that had the most profound impact on the language? And what, in your opinion, one single feature in 2020 C++ that will have that similar effect? Um, I think probably... I'm going to cheat. I'm going to give two of each. Um, the, the most important single feature that affects the way you, 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 you write code in C++11 is context for functions. Moving a lot of the complex template metaprogramming into simple ordinary programming with functions to produce values so that template metaprogramming can be reserved to the things that, that computes types and things that doesn't fit into the functional pattern very well. Uh, and this has been spreading like wildfire to the point where I'm worrying that we are doing too much of it. The invisible part of uh, C++11 that was most important is simply the support for basic concurrency. Um, we had been doing concurrent programming for ages before, but it's not been standard. People have been using POSIX directly, using macros and void star stars, lifting the level of, of uh, expression of the thread and locks kind of code to a type safe level and having a machine model underlying it that makes it make sense. Uh, was the most important. So we have the visible thing, which is the context per function, and the invisible things, which is basically the concurrency model. Uh, similar for C++20, I think the thing that will have the most impact on the way we write code is concepts, because it will make generic code much easier, much more elegant, and much more widely useful, uh, increasing um, the expressibility of what we are doing um, and again, taking some parts of what is now complicated template metaprogramming and turning it into something much simpler. Template metaprogramming was a widely successful uh, C++ 98 feature, um, but it didn't have enough support. And the fact that it was so heavily used over the years, even though it was so ugly and difficult, is a proof of its utility. So we, make, we have to make it's easier to do the things that was done with template metaprogramming. The invisible part actually is the modules. The modules should, with a bit of luck, improve our uh, compile speeds by, um, say, five to 10 times. Uh, and, and that is a major thing. It'll change the way we work. But the fundamental structure of our programs will actually not change. That's why I call it invisible. The way you get that advantage, major compile time advantage, is by cleaning up your code, removing disgusting dependencies, uh, saving the compiler for compiling the same thing 10 times over because you might have a macro that is different. So, yeah, cheating, I can't count to one, I've got two, but uh, I, I think I have a point. Yes? Thank you. Uh, hey, Yarna, David Holman, Sandia National Labs. Uh, so I wanted to go back to your uh, don't pay for what you, you don't use um, principle, which I very much strongly agree with. Um, but I had a colleague recently uh, challenge me on that, saying that if we add time zones to 20, or if we add graphics or whatever to 23, and we don't use them as a company, we still pay for them because we pay the implementers to implement those things in money, not in cycles. Um, but it, I thought that was, I had, I had a response for him that I wasn't quite satisfied with myself. I'd be interested to hear your response to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, somebody has to pay. And. Uh, I think maybe 
my statement of the uh, zero overhead principle has been taken out of the context of writing code and looking at the uh, generated machine code and such and into a different domain. And I have, for a long time, I think it's in DNA, had the philosophy that if you can do things once or a hundred times or a thousand times, it's much, much better to do it in a, than doing it in a million times. And therefore, I'd rather put a burden on implementers than on users. And I think that's what we're doing here. A lot of users benefit. I know huge industries that depend critically on chrono with time zones and the works. And they pay a price every time they uh, use a, a time zone library. And sometimes that price is in the dollars to library vendors and such. All of that code goes away, maybe for 10, 50,000 uh, organizations on Earth, and uh, your implementers get stuck with it. How many are there? Five, 10? I think I just made a major saving for the community. Um, that, that's the principle that, that I can bring forward here. But, but I think the, the principle was yanked out of context. Hello, Biari. Thank you very much for the talk. My name is Kirill, I work for Yandex. And here's my question. Two of the rules of thumb you mentioned were compile, compile time detection and systematic general resource management, specifically the ownership management. But there is nothing in C++ that enforces ownership control at compile time, like the borrow checker in the Rust programming language. Are there any plans on introducing a new mechanism that will check ownership at compile time? Thank you. Um, I don't have any plans for a feature that enforces ownership at compile time. The, the problem with that is that then all the old code that doesn't use it will break. Uh, instead, I'm aiming at this distinction between the uh, code that we consider good and the control we consider legal. And we use coding guidelines and statically enforced coding guidelines where we can and to the extent we can, as opposed to changing the language to try to enforce something that we probably put. I do not know how much C++ code is out there, but I have been told off recently for saying hundreds of billions of lines. Somebody wants me to mention trillion, and I'm not sure I can, but we're getting there. And that means that changing the language to outlaw most of that is not going to fly. So instead, I want to aim for, for code checkers and style guides because if you have a style guide that says you don't have any leaks, and there's leak finders now, static leak finders, that proves that you actually can do it in the language if you want it, but I don't see us deploying such a language feature. Thanks for the answer. Thanks for the talk. Uh, my name is Cyril, I'm from Bloomberg. Going forward on the, on designing new projects, starting from scratch, uh, would you discourage reliance on abstract base classes as interfaces, as abstractions, and uh, possibly going forward, is it, are there any plans to phase out dynamic polymorphism altogether? Um, first of all, it is very rare that we start really from scratch. It is much more common that there is a code base already or that we start by including um, five or 10 uh, fairly massive libraries that were designed 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, furthermore, I'm still of the opinion that there are domains where classical object-oriented programming 
is a good and possibly even the best solution. So I would not discourage the use of class hierarchies and virtual functions. What I would do and do is to recommend people look carefully at the uh, problem to be solved and see if it really is hierarchical and if it really does need runtime resolution and it really needs open sets of alternatives. And if the answer to those things are yes, use traditional hierarchy-based object-oriented programming. And my suspicion is that there is very significant sections of the fundamental problem areas for which this makes sense. And there's a much larger series where there are libraries and support systems that are structured that way, uh, mostly in graphics and GUI, but also in um, control of uh, hardware gadgets where you have an abstract uh, class as a stable interface to a series of gadgets, say different models, electromotors and such. In other words, I don't think everything should be a template. I think we have run out, so thank you.